All right, here we are, Full Vantage Podcast with the Rhett Taylor. Dude, it has been uh, it's been a short time coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you want to say it's been a long time coming because we've known each other a long time. But man, the first time that I met Rhett, I was like, I just got to get to know this guy better. <laughs> because we sat next to each other in one of our friend's backyards, and we had the best, like conversation with a group of friends and really not even a group of friends a group of acquaintances uh slash strangers yeah. and then that have become more and more friends and uh when we sat together i was like okay this is what we need to do uh rest an outdoors guy i'm hearing about all the things that you're doing i'm like okay maybe i can get on a hike or a run with you uh because i love that and, and then we did and got to hear about your life. And I was like, man, we, I would just love to get the next phase of questions that I would have for you and just conversation uh, on uh, just recorded. And on top of that, just even what you said just a second ago, you said, we're really just after that 5%. Uh, do you care to speak to that real quick? Like that, what is that 5% yeah. that we're after specifically in conversation or anything? And then we can like dive into like, who you are and your background and stuff, which is great. But I'd love for you just at the top, hit us with a haymaker. <laughs> well, thanks, Trevor. Yeah, man. So the 5%, I mean, that's where I want to live. It's, um, you know, for the most part, conversations are about sports, the weather, the kids, the this, the that, you know, and that's all fine. But I really want to live on the 5%, right? And it's like the 5% on either end of that bell curve, right? And maybe it's at the beginning of the bell curve where, you know, it's the stuff that's like really scary, the stuff that's really freaking us out that we don't know how to deal with, um, that's that's keeping us up at night. And, you know, maybe we're not sharing it with other people. And, you know, that's a big problem. Uh, or it's on the other end of the bell curve. And it's that, you know, 5% that we're too, too humble to share. You know, we, we don't want to sound like we're bragging. And, um, and these are the places where I want to live. It's, it's exciting. It can be scary. It makes you feel as opposed to the, you know, just the, the standard stuff that we all talk about. Oh, man. Yes. Yes. Standard stuff that we all talk about. There's this question that a friend of mine, you're just making me think of uh, another friend of mine, who when he is traveling or he's with somebody that he doesn't think logically – he's ever going to see again, he'll sit down and he'll be like, okay, um, look, we can talk about the weather. We could talk about sport. We can talk about football. We can talk about whatever you want. And that's awesome. But just know this, we may never, like, that's not going to change our life. And that's not necessarily what I'm after. What's the conversation that if we had, it would change your life and my life forever? What's that topic? Because I'm after that. Mm -hmm. We can go one or two directions and I'm cool. I'm chilling. Either way you want to go. Yeah, I'm down. But like, we should at least have a moment where we can say, let's, let's maybe opt in for something else. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I'm probably going to use that, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's true. And you know, I'm part of a couple organizations that this is all we, all we do. And we, we don't allow each other to, to talk about anything other than the 5%. Maybe it's 10%. And then sometimes storytelling will creep in. You know, you start telling the story and the this and the that. It's like, come on, let's, let's keep it on track. Let's hear, let's hear about that 5% or even the 1%. You know, like the 1% that you don't even know about. Mm. The other day I, I worked with a, a guy, Paul, who he is a, he's a writer and uh, teaches writing at CU. He, um, he said, I wanna tell your story. I think you have a really interesting hero's journey that I wanna tell, and I want you to be able to tell it. So he gave me the allegory of the cave. Have you ever heard of this? No, no, I so, haven't. So the allegory of the cave was written by Plato back in Plato's day, and it talks about a group of people who are, are stuck in this cave, and they've lived their entire lives in the cave, generations upon generation, and one day, one of the guys decides, I'm leaving the cave. And they all say, you're crazy. Nobody's ever left the cave. You can't do it. He goes, you know what? I'm leaving the cave. And so he goes out and he realizes, holy shit, there's, this, there's a whole world out there. It's beautiful. There's, a, there's sun. There's flowers. There's, there's all types of great things out here. He goes, I got to tell, tell the boys. 
So he goes back into the cave and he starts yelling at them, you got to come see this. And, and he doesn't have the, the words to articulate it. He doesn't know how he, can, how he can convince them that there's this big, bright, beautiful, healthy world out there. And what do they do? They, they kill him. They kill this guy who's gone out because he's this, this heretic and he's gone beyond the pale. And, uh, and the, the point of Plato's story is that you've got to be able to articulate. You've got to be able to share in a way that, that convinces people. And so Paul said, I, wa- I, want to be able to, I want to help you tell your story. And so we spent a whole day working together, and it was great. And he dragged me into places I haven't been since, since I was a child. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm big into coaching and coaches, but I haven't done too much therapy. And I haven't, like, dug deep into my childhood. And he had me back at a point in my my childhood where I was probably 10, where I'm in a bus station in Albuquerque, and it's cold, and my mom's face is worried, and my sisters and I are are tired and hungry, and it's midnight, and it's scary, and it brought me back to a place where I felt like I was getting dragged into. I knew I didn't want to be like the people that I was looking at in the bus station passed out on the floor. Um, I knew this wasn't where I wanted to be. And I felt really dragged there. And Paul brought me back to that place that I haven't gone in ages. You know, I, I suppress that memory. And so that's the 1%, right? So we can talk about 5%, but you know, what's the 1%? I don't really want to go there. Yesterday, literally yesterday, I spent 90 minutes with uh, a coach, but it felt like a counseling session. Mm. And it was in between like that counseling versus um, it, it was in between counseling and it was in between like coaching. And it was much more counseling than coaching. And I, I'm like, that's great. I'm, I'm cool with that. That's fine. And I've taken a lot of personality tests. And he had me take this test um, called the Harrison Assessment mm-hmm. that's, that's about how you, and I'm, I may get this wrong, but it, it, here's how I understood it. It's about how you, uh, the habits that you have that are subconscious that you don't actually really even know that are there. Mm. And he's trying to help you rework your mind and how you think about those things. Come to find out uh, that I actually am imbalanced in some areas, which most people are, because humans, like, we, we're always going through things. You're not that, perfect? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Like, like, everyone has, like, so many different things that we've suppressed or that are in our past. And yesterday, he took me back mm. to a moment of my childhood where uh, I had a great childhood, but we had to, like, move a lot. Yeah. And I learned how to, uh, I learned how to not value myself, but I learned how to value what other people liked about who I was, mm. how to learn how to get other people to like me. Mm-hmm. And so I have a low self view of myself, mm. almost a low self worth is how I understood it. And I was like, that's so interesting. And it, the paradox was compared to helping others and serving others which I was really high in Mm -hmm. it was like oh okay cool I like to help and serve others and I was like well I don't need a high view of myself and he was like no 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 you don't get it the paradox is unhealthy and you can't get the best out of what you want if you do not begin to learn why you have a uh, low self view of yourself Mm -hmm. you can't help more it'll flip and you'll have the opposite effect happen uh, if you are tired or stressed or there's a, a, pin, uh, a pinch point or something that's like gets you off track, then what you do is then you become demanding mm. or you become intense or it's your way or the highway type of thing. And I was like, whoa, that's interesting because that's the opposite of help. And he was like, exactly. You'll flip because you're imbalanced. It's like he said, it's kind of like how I understood of what he was saying. It's kind of like flipping a boat. It's really difficult to flip it back. Mm. But sometimes it may flip. If the water is rough or it's rocky, 
anyways, that what's interesting is is like that happened to you. Well, that happened to me yesterday, and I was like, <laughs> I was back. I was this first day of school in a new school on a on a regular basis. You know, every few yeah. years, and I was like, I got used to. Don't worry about who you are. Don't even try to be yourself. Oh. Uh, be who other people uh, want you to be. Yeah. And, you know, over time, that that was really, you know, there was a few moments where I was like, man, I feel like I'm about to cry right now. And, you know, I, you know, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, this is intense. Uh, it's really, what, what, what happened to you when you went back to that moment? that 1% moment. What, what do you carry now from then, maybe? A much deeper understanding of who I have become. That was the moment, I believe, where I decided that I needed to be in control. I decided that I wasn't going to get dragged along anymore. I decided that I needed to have resources, that I needed to be the kind of person who didn't end up on the floor of a bus station at midnight and cold Albuquerque. Um, and so I've, I've spent the last 35 years trying to be that person and gripping with all of my might at that, just really, really holding on as hard as I can and wanting, wanting, wanting. And I've realized recently that the universe, God doesn't care what you want. (laughs) The universe doesn't care if you hold on, if you think you can just power through things. Um, And that's what I've done. And I've just been a a brutal masochist toward myself, toward getting the things that I want so that I never end up on that bus station floor or even just back in a bus station. And so I've spent a lot of time working really hard. And I've learned recently about surrender. And that's been massively impactful for me. It's changing my entire direction in life. Wow. I think it's, I think it's, um, the thing that is really coming to the forefront, just even in my, just even in my heart right now is, um, how do you, I, 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 let me call a timeout. I love how we've just like, just right like that, <laughs> just like gas pedal all the way down, d- dialed. You're like, oh man, I turned this on. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm all the way there. Yes, we will get to kind of like w- what what's come, like what what you've been doing, kind of what you're doing right now. I just want people to know that. But like, this is this is what makes you you right now. This is what makes you sit on the grass in someone's backyard and share really valuable things to you. Or when we're on a run and you're like, this is just who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, Why is that important for someone to get there? Mm. Well, knowing who we are is, is the basis for everything else. And... Once you know who you are, then you can move in the direction that's aligned with your integrity. And when we move with integrity, things feel right. Yeah. Things work out. Yeah. The universe, God transpires to help you. Things go your way. You begin to battle downhill. You begin to, to swim downstream instead of upstream. Mm. And, you know, a lot of us idolize struggle and we have these stories from our families from society that say struggle is good you know like you know I'm Irish background you know come over on the boat struggle 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 work 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 uh, you know hopefully make the generation a little bit better that generation still struggles you know so it's that whole story and the mythology around that and there is a lot of value in hard work there's a lot of value in being able to do that but the real value i think is i've recently realized is in not having to work hard you know it's in being in flow it's in letting things roll off your tongue right so you know 
instead of idolizing the struggle, idolize the, the person for whom it's easy and they work less because it's aligned with their integrity. I've, I've always kind of thought and even said that if you really want to go somewhere, if you really want to become who you were created to be or who you really are and move forward and grow, it always begins with honesty, mm -hmm. integrity. Mm -hmm. Because you can't get the person who lies to go anywhere because they don't even know who they are. Isn't like one of the most important things that we do is to uh, know thyself? Like if mm -hmm. we're going to go to f philosophy and we're going to go, it's like the art of knowing thyself. Yeah. And yeah. the power that comes with like, oh, I actually know the, the blind spots I have. Mm -hmm. I actually know the issues that I have. I actually know that I have low self-worth. Mm -hmm. Because if I know that I have low self-worth, well, what can I do? I can actually have a conversation and I can grow and I can get. Absolutely. I can actually go somewhere with yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, man. This, so you're touching on what for me is the most exciting part of life. It's exploring those, those limits. It's pushing the limits. It's understanding what is you to begin with and then diving into it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Gosh. My, my dream, one of my dreams, is to build communities and to help people build communities mm. to where they actually have friends, not where we like do anything else we, we we can get in the 10 percent and the 20 percent. i love where, where, where we've started even this conversation where, but where we lean into the five like right now like even just how you have started our friend like how we started our friendship like yeah it like that yeah okay my the dream is that because from a place of honesty we can actually have what we dream of mm -hmm. and that's the only way that we actually make friends mm -hmm. that's the only way that we can come to realize the truth is from a place of honesty. And I've, I've always thought that um, we, were, we were, I had a bunch, of fr I have a bunch of friends over at the house last night and we were having the, the best conversation. We had dinner, Chinese takeout, right? Like great vibe. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we were all sitting, I got this like folding white table out in my house and I don't have like a big house. So it's like, we're all kind of cramped in this house, but it feels awesome. Because there's a bunch of people that just care about each other there, and they're pers we're pursuing like friendship and relationship. And I was like, "Hey, just to be honest, like there came a moment in the night where I said, "Hey, can I share like a fear that I have?" Nice. <laughs> yeah, right. Like <laughs> I feel like that's that's a total <laughs> ret move right there. Let me just let me just share a fear that I have. And well, you know what? It wasn't a few years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's important. But don't let me. I want no, to no. That's continue, it. That, yeah, and we're gonna we're, we're gonna hit that for sure because, mm -hmm. you know, I've talked about that. But I, I said one of my biggest fears is that I end up in life thinking that I'm gonna get somewhere or have something that I never have and I never get. Mm. Living a lie. Or thinking that I have something that I really don't have. Mm. Um, and the only way to make for me to make sure that I actually have what I hope to have is to be honest about what I actually have and who I actually am yeah. and what I'm actually going through. And so like that just sparked a crazy conversation. And uh, man, I just, as you think about now back to what you were just saying, like what you love about that, as you think about maybe even a fear that you have, even just back to your childhood, that fear that you're like, Oh, that was the moment. Mm -hmm. where I was going to let fear fuel me. Because mm -hmm. in some ways, that's what you're saying. You let that fear in that whole moment scenario fuel you to your future, yeah. um, which you have a great, like, I don't think yeah, you hate well, your life, but like. You know, it, it has fueled me into a lot of things that on paper look really, really great. You know, I'm, I've been, I've started multiple good companies. Yeah. I've exited. I've. I've made money, I've not, I've lived all over the world, I've flown in private planes and, you know, all of it. But um, I don't think I, I didn't really truly know myself until much more recently. And um, honestly, it's, it's taken some hard lumps 
uh, really getting beat up over the last couple of years to begin to want to go there. And um, it's through that fire that I've, I've been reborn and found what, what, who I really am and, you know, just how big it can be, how exciting it can be to explore the edges of that. Um, so with that, do you care to just kind of color, color it in so that everyone kind of knows, okay, like, you know, you founded this um, supplement company called Ned uh, with a partner of yours. And then like, maybe like, give us a scope of like, where did you live in the world? You know, maybe yeah. like, what was the, what was the come up, so to speak, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. uh, in, in, in kind of where we are today? Do you mind yeah. to kind of just like, give us a little bit of yeah, sure. color well, commentary? You know, grew up with no money. Uh, my mom was, it was kind of ironic. My mom was a uh, student at Harvard. We're living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She's got three kids to raise on her own. Um, and she's getting her, her master's, then her doctorate at Harvard. So, you know, kind of, uh, you know, very economically very poor, but like socially extremely rich. I went to one of the most diverse high schools there is, 126 different countries, you know, sons and daughters of Harvard professors and biotech CEOs to brand new Haitian immigrants who just got there the day before. Um, and so and they did like a show about it, right? Like yeah, they did like yeah. a parody type of thing. Yeah. They, they compared that high school to a, like a very rich white high school in Dallas and, and, oh, yeah. and showed the prom. <laughs> but, um, you know, it gave me a, an amazing background to be able to relate to and, and, um, relate with, uh, all types of people. So, um, you know, thought though without that money i thought the money was the answer and so like so many of us we go out and we just try to make money and uh, my first job was in saudi arabia <clears throat> it was two months after 9 11. i graduated in december and i'm on my way to saudi arabia uh, i get there my business card says environmental expert uh, <laughs> i had taken one environmental policy class i really liked the outdoors uh, i recycled so i was qualified <laughs> And, um, but it was an amazing opportunity and I'm 22 years old and I'm, I'm running a $350 million project meeting with princes and CEOs and, um, had an amazing time. And I had, I was way too young and naive to know that I was, I was in way over my head. Um, and I went with it and it gave me a ton of confidence. Um, we ended up, the money for that project ended up, uh, going back to Iraq. I ended up chasing some Iraq contracts, the, uh, the hospitals and the schools, um, you know, super interesting. I'm there in a room at one point, I'm 23 years old with the CEO of Bechtel, the CEO of Halliburton, um, you know, multi, multi billion dollar companies and me, everybody thought I was the, uh, like somebody's assistant. <laughs> no, you're the savant in the room. Yeah, no, they thought I was like getting coffee, but, um, you know, that was a, a really interesting time and ended up afterward in Miami. I went from Saudi to South Beach, like the most repressive society at the time to the most hedonistic. And then uh, ended up in Brazil on a whim. A, a girl I was dating asked me to move there with her. And, you know, I, I had quite a bit of confidence um, based on these experiences. And two weeks later, I'm in Sao Paulo. Uh, and a day later, I'm co-founding the Brazilian Green Building Council which we went on to, uh, to create over the course of about a year. And today, I think there's over a thousand LEED certified buildings in Brazil. I uh, spent all my money doing that and surfing and kiteboarding and drinking caipaninhas and, and gallivanting all over Brazil, which in my mind is one of the most beautiful, unique and interesting com countries in the world. Uh, yeah, had no money and got a call from a friend's father. He said, hey, would you come uh, be our sales representative in New York City and sell hotel mirrors? It's like, what? <laughs> Absolutely not. And he said, listen, if, if you don't make five hundred to to $700,000 in the first year and a million going forward, like, you'd be doing something wrong. So I said, yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, and I thought, you know, I'll do this for two, three years, save a bit of money, and then go do what I'm passionate about. Mm. And it was really the first time when I, I like made a decision based on that money 
And so I find myself in New York City, which I'm a nature guy. I'm a mountain guy. But I ended up loving it. Uh, it was good for me at that time in my life. Uh, but I started this business for which I had zero passion. I had absolutely no interest in hotel furniture fixtures or equipment. Um, it was a complete widget to me. It was all about making some money so that I could go do what I wanted to do. Two years turned into five, turned into 12, turned yeah, into So you were only there years. for three weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> yeah, I wish. Well, I don't wish because it's been formative. There it is, yeah. And um, I ended up taking the business to Saudi Arabia again. Um, I had a great opportunity to go work with my former boss there. I ended up working on all types of projects, uh, building the family office for the, the king's son. Um, I ended up becoming the biggest supplier of military tents in the Middle East. That was a wild story. You know, picture, uh, picture one of those arms bazaars. With I'm there with my tents. We're on a tarmac in the middle of the desert. There's you know sheiks and generals walking around, and next to me there's a Chinese bazooka company, and and on the other side there's a Czech armored vehicle company, and then me with my my American-made tents. But um, you know it was an adventure, and and again always I just had this confidence that it would go and go and go, and I had this grip on things. You just keep going, like keep going, work harder, work harder, work harder. It'll happen. Uh, meantime, though, I had just gotten married and become a father and my wife and daughter, I realized this wasn't going to work for them. And so had to make the choice between, you know, millions and millions of dollars and my family. And it was pretty easy. Um, so we moved to Boulder, Colorado. I got back to nature. I got back to the mountains, simplicity. And it was one of the best things I ever did for myself. Um, that return to nature was, was really important for me. And a summer later, my wife and daughter were in the Netherlands, where my wife's from, for two months. And I ended up spending the entire summer, um, about 50 days, entirely outdoors. It was an experiment to see how much I could thrive when I really got back to nature. And I sold my BMW, I got my 4Runner, threw my tent and sleeping bag, fly rod and bike in the back, and lived outside, lived and worked outside for, for 50 days. Um, I mean, within two days, I'm thriving. Within, within a week, I've never felt better. And, um, you know, I would, I would wake up with the sun, I would exercise, do something natural. I, I'd jump in any body of water I was near, that was my shower. And then I'd go work outdoors. I'd eat healthy all day and I'd go to bed when the sun set. At the end of the day, I'd have a big adventure. I'd climb something or, or, or raft something or ride something. And I just, I felt great and I was healing. Like I, I really needed to heal after, after Saudi, after being separated from my family. Uh, there was a lot there that I endured. And not only did I heal, I began to thrive. And toward the end of it, I said, you know, I want this, I want to share this with people. This, I really truly believe that a lot of the ailments in our society are due to our disconnect from nature. We evolved in nature, as nature. We are nature. But we've become more and more disconnected from it. And again, a lot of, a lot of what's, what we're suffering from is due to that disconnect. So I, I determined I would sell the furniture business and I would go into a different type of business, one that would be aligned with my values. Finally, finally, I got out of my way. And um, I started a company called Ned that helps people um, feel better and live better through the powers of nature. And we do that through all different types of natural remedies. So, you know, there was also, my mom was battling cancer at the time and I was finding a, a real passion for, for nature or for natural remedies rather always a passion for nature um it's been seven years and it's been absolutely beautiful but i realized at the time or i realized more recently that it even though it felt in like it was an integrity there was a key decision i made back when i decided to start this business i said again let me do this, make some money, and then I'll do what, I'm, what I really want to do. 
Now, Ned was originally going to be a much bigger business that was consulting and products and also coaching and actually getting people outdoors for retreats, Yeah, which is my real passion. And I thought, you know, that's not really scalable. There's not enough money in it. Who am I to do this? Fear crept in. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? Let me do what's a bit safer. I can start a, a natural products rem a natural products company. I can grow that. I'll have a tangible business that I can sell, make millions, yeah. and go do what I really want to yeah. do. So the same thing oh, happened. Th and that question came back. Mm -hmm. I want to go. I'll do this so I can go do what I really want to do. What I really want to do. Again. Again, and I, I wish I had mentors at the time who could have kicked me in the ass and said, dude, you're doing it again. <laughs> Just like the yeah. three or four, fifth, six, you know, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I recently was invited to go do a, a retreat for, for some friends up in Vail. Uh, run a Masogi for them. They know that I'm into this thing called Masogi, and they asked me to come and teach them and, and actually lead them through a Masogi. I said, absolutely, I'd love to. And I, I did it for them and it, it felt so aligned. I, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it again. Mm -hmm. It felt like for the first time in, since I was a child, I was aligned with, with my integrity. Wow. I was doing what I'm put on this earth to do. And then two weeks later, I was asked to come lead another retreat in Nebraska and get people outdoors and reconnect with nature. And and I went there with really no, no instructions. There was a part of a, a bigger retreat. I was going to have a small part in it. And um, at one point, I'm sitting there in a circle. Um, half the people there are, are multi-billionaires. And I'm put on the spot. He says, uh, the retreat facilitator, Finn, he says, and now Rhett's going to give us a talk about reconnecting with nature and then lead us. <laughs> on a nature walk you were you were given zero no heads up <laughs> yeah zero heads up i didn't even know if this was going to happen and in the you know and the the intro was that long it was three seconds yeah rhett's going to do this all right everybody pay attention to Rhett. yeah all eyes on on me and in the first second i said oh shit <laughs> and then the next second i said well wait a minute this is what you love this is what you do this is who you are this is okay and then I took a deep breath and I began. And I spoke for 20, I don't even know actually, maybe 20, 15, 30 minutes. I lost track of time. I was in a flow state. And I just allowed myself to get into that state. And I spoke more eloquently then than I have in ages. And I said to myself, it shouldn't be hard. It really, really shouldn't be hard. This is it. This is easy. A week later, I went to a conference, the Conscious Entrepreneur Summit in Boulder amazing conference put on by my good friend Alex Raymond and it was all about <clears throat> how hard it is to be an entrepreneur you know we've all got a screw loose we're all masochists we all we all just suffer idolizers and I thought to myself yes that's how it's been but it doesn't have to be if you're doing what God puts you here for what you, what the universe wants of you then it should roll off the tip of your tongue. And that was a big aha moment for me. Um, I also realized too that a lot of us don't, and we spend our entire lives doing what we think others want us to do, doing what we think society wants us to do, or doing what we've talked ourselves into, like I did with Ned. And it makes us sick. Yeah. You mentioned liars. We get sick when we lie. When we're out of alignment with our integrity, we feel it in our bones, in our vibration, in our whole energy, and everybody else feels it too. And so I realized that if I kept doing, if I kept staying out of my integrity, I could actually die from it. I could literally die from it. Do you care to describe what integrity is mm. for us? Like what have you, maybe even... What, what was integrity before and now what, maybe even what is integrity now? Because I bet, it's a, I bet it's a little bit different for you in how you viewed it. Or maybe it's the same and you just yeah. suppressed it or maybe it was different. Or Yeah, you know, 
Martha Beck has a great book, The Way of Integrity. Mm. Uh, Martha Beck's amazing, amazing writer and, and coach. And um, I highly recommend checking out that book. But integrity to me is honesty. It's, it's being in alignment with your honesty. Um, and that's simply put, and I think sums it up. No, I, I, I totally agree. As, as you are, you're such a, how do you say, integrous? And, and, and <laughs> I don't think that's the right word. Um, but you have a lot of integrity. And as you look at that moment of like where fear crept in mm-hmm. and made you settle for maybe less than what you really felt like you needed to be doing to, to keep integrity or to have it just even to yourself, but you were setting for less than what your dream really was and what you were intending to do. Uh, why do you think fear, why do you think fear crept in maybe for you, but why do you think fear creeps in for us as humans? Well, we're hardwired to, to be afraid. Um, and as we evolved, that was oftentimes rightfully so, you know, there were a lot of things that could kill us back in the day. A snake bite was fatal. A scratch from a, from a saber-toothed tiger was fatal. You know, a lot of things were fatal before, before modern medicine. And um, it's why we're still really good at spotting a snake in the grass or, or feeling, sensing, rustling in the bushes. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, you know, there's a lot of things today that are much more dangerous and kill us far more often like, like car accidents that we're not afraid of because we didn't evolve with cars. Um, so fear, we're hardwired to be afraid, but a lot of what we fear these days is no longer relevant. And so getting through that fear, getting through that is a big part of what we were talking about earlier mm-hmm. and how we can live our best, most abundant, awesome lives i love that because as you think about it if fear maybe cripples us or stops us from moving forward and why are we afraid i think that's a big uh piece of integrity for us as personally like for me it's like i need to i need to think through that why am i afraid in this moment is there something to actually fear mm-hmm. or is it a facade? Mm-hmm. Is, it, is it fake or is it superficial or does it even matter? Mm-hmm. Does it genuinely matter at the end of the day mm-hmm. in 10 years, in 100 years, after I'm gone, does it even matter? Mm-hmm. And if, it, if I can put it in the right framework, then I can put it in its place and not let it control me. Mm-hmm. And something that's, that's really big that I'm even thinking of with you that I'd really like to learn is maybe even a few things that, that I could do or that we could do to like, okay, if there is fear, identifying it, working through it. But then like what, what leads you to not settle? Mm. What leads you mm. to say, hey, I'm going to keep <clears throat> stepping forward. I'm going to keep moving forward because you've been afraid. You've been through a lot of things. You've had a lot of big moments. You've had some small ones. You've had some difficult ones. I mean, yes. But, and you've, you've got a great like, point of view on the world. I think it's a powerful thing to be able to go to different cultures and experience different things. How do you use all of that to gain perspective mm-hmm. and to not settle? Yeah. Well, I think faith. Faith is a big part of it, right? And so... I'm 45. Like I've I've been through it, you know. Um, there's a reason mentors are mostly older, and um, I've got a lot of. I've been through a lot, and um, it's led me to, to a, a deeper confidence and a deeper faith, and the faith comes when you're in integrity, when you're in alignment, and if you believe that God or the universe will help you when you're aligned, then there's nothing to be afraid of. It's when you're out of alignment that you, you can and maybe should be afraid because you're fighting uphill. You, uh, you're, you're quoting, in my mind, you know, we've, we've talked a lot, of, we've talked a little bit about faith. In my mind, you're quoting even some, you're quoting the Bible a little bit even too because you're like, 
I mean, I just thought of like Romans eight twenty eight. All things work together for the good of those who love him and live according to his purposes. And it's like, whoa, whoa, all things work together. For, are you th- what are you talking about? Yeah. You just said <laughs> everything works together for the good uh-huh. of those who love him and live according to his purposes. And it's like, oh, my gosh, that is powerful. How does that happen? And then you're like, well, it's, it's faith. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's like, man, I'm just, I love how you move forward in life. Can you teach us? Yes, faith. I, I, yes. But can you teach us, like, maybe even, like, if someone's having a difficult time moving forward, they're crippled mentally, you know, physically, spiritually, whatever, whatever like, whatever is stopping them from moving forward, they, they have the ability to move forward, mm-hmm. but they are, they are stuck. Yeah. What would you do as a coach, because yeah. you are a coach, <laughs> and you are, you do retreats, I can't wait to come hang out on one of those things sometime um but like what would you do with that person they have a billion dollars they have mm-hmm. a million dollars. doesn't matter the money because you've probably seen the, the the range and there's something that's stopping that person yeah what would you yeah do? there's something that stops so many of us all of us doesn't at some point yeah or many points um you know i think at first it goes back to knowing yourself who are you and there's a lot you can do to begin to know who you are. Um, it's a deep dive. It, it can be a really fun exercise and a really interesting journey to understand who you are. And so it's both internal and external. And you can go first, well, you can go the external route and start asking people. Ask, ask people who know you well, you know, who am I? Who am I to you? If you need something from me, if you need something, what are you coming to me for? You know, what do you see as my strengths, my weaknesses? What are my blind spots? And like, ask the people who really, truly know you. Get that feedback. You can do, you mentioned personality tests earlier. You can do personality tests and, and there's a lot to those. Um, some people will throw them out if they see something that doesn't resonate, but just cross that off, cross that line off. And do a few so that you've got multiple points on the compass there. Uh, And then start to look for the themes. So really start to know yourself. Journal. You know, I'm big into just dumping out on a journal uh, all your thoughts. Don't put any thought toward grammar or spelling or penmanship. Just dump it out. I appreciate that personally. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. So, So, yeah, that's good for me. Yeah. Uh, and really get to know yourself. And that can take a little while, but it's a really fun, fun journey. And then the other side is, is reconnect. Like reconnect with, with who you are. Reconnect with nature. Reconnect with our original home, our, our original mother, which is nature. We are from nature. We are born by nature. Mm-hmm. And, um, and begin to reconnect. Yeah. So what I love to do is, is get out into nature with people. It's my favorite thing on earth and start to explore these questions and find some reverence, like just slow down. Yeah. You know, when we slow down, that's when we find reverence. When we slow down, that's when the questions begin. The answers begin to come to the questions. Yeah. There's so much. And it's all so fun, and it's just also badass, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you're referencing in that right there is Masogi for you. Yeah, that's part of it. A part of, like, a part of it, because it's like that adventure, mm-hmm. that potential for failure, and finding out who you really are, that's kind of where that's come from you. Do you care, what, what is Masogi? We've talked about this. It'd be great if you just if we kind of leaned into this now, because I, I, this has been a big part of, this is a big part of your life right now. It and is. It probably will be <laughs> yeah. going into the future and what you help people with and on your retreats. And so let's, mm-hmm. that would be great for you to like give us yeah. a breakdown. Well, you know, big challenges, 
big adventures outdoors. These have always been a big part of my life, but I've kind of put them to the side and I've thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do those on the weekend, but now I'm doing them on the weekdays and I'm starting to work with people and people have been coming to me for ages, you know, help me with this, help me with this. And, um, I'm finally listening to that and I'm finally getting out of my own way to go and do that. And so, but yeah, Misogi is, is one, one arrow in the quiver. Um, it's a good one. I personally love it. So for those that don't know what a Misogi is, it goes way back to ancient Japanese culture. Um, and really the first text, the, the oldest living surviving text um, in Japanese culture. And it talks about the, the, the ancient Shinto gods. And it starts, I think, maybe like one of the most badass stories there is about Izanagi, who he was a, a Shinto god married to an amazing goddess who died in childbirth and went to the underworld where all the Shinto gods went. And Izanagi spent all his time weeping and pulling his hair out and uh, just distraught. He was a mess, a basket case. And so eventually he says, I got to change my life. I want to do something to feel better. So he says, I'm, I'm a god. I'm going to go into the underworld and I'm going to bring my wife back and then I'll be happy again. So he goes on this epic quest through the underworld, through hell. There's demons and fire and brimstone and all of it. And he's, you know, fighting his way through. He finally makes it to his wife. And he sees, though, that she's beginning to succumb to the degradations of hell. And she's decaying and she's becoming demonic herself. And he kind of looks down at his hand and he sees that he's decaying too. And he better get the hell out of there, save himself. So he turns around and he makes this mad dash for the gates. And there's demons pulling at him and, and trying to hold him back. And he's fighting and he, he thinks he's not going to make it. And he finds an, another gear and he perseveres mentally and physically. And he finally breaks through the gates. And he he jumps in this ice cold river and he feels what's called the sumakiri. It's this like explosion of energy and purity. And, and he feels all of the, the detritus of hell being washed from him. And he's, he's purified and he's never felt better. And so that has become misogi. And in Shinto tradition, people will go to cold water every year, once a year, and, and purify themselves. And, and this has been happening for 2,000, 2,500 years. Um, samurais, Aikido, Judo, it's been a great way, it's been a way for people to purify. And so, more recently though, um, there is a amazing guy, Dr. Marcus Elliott, who was a triathlete and, and just an all-around badass Harvard doctor who started calling uh, these outdoor challenges that he would do uh, misogis, misogi challenges. And, and, you know, less about the purifying with the water, more about the challenge that Izanagi went through, which is also incredibly purifying. We have a lot of friends who just finished the Leadville 100. That is one badass misogi. Um, it's a very purifying thing. And so, so a, a misogi has become really two things. In Eastern culture, it's that, that water purification. In the West, it's become a, a big, hard, 50% chance of failure, uh, endurance event outdoors. And I just love this. <laughs> and the idea is, from what I'm hearing from you, just to like make this clear, is it's an adventure where it's a 50% success rate. Yeah, it should be so hard, so daunting in your mind that you have, your chances of success are only 50-50. And you should fail. You should fail half the time. I've been doing Masogis now since I, I mean, really I've been an endurance athlete most most of my my life since I was 14. But um, I've been doing misogis in the pure sense of the term since 2019, I think, when there was an outside article published about this. 
And I've failed at, at about half my Masogis. I failed this year. I, I tried climbing Denali. Um, and we got shut down at 16,200 feet with two massive storms rolling in. And it was a choice between sitting in our tents for a week to two weeks uh, in negative 40 degrees, running out of food and trying to make the summit or we turn around and we, we do it next year. And um, so I failed in that one. Uh, last year I did a, or yeah, last year I did a, a uh, four day vision quest where I parked my ass on a, on a cliff side in the desert of Utah with no food for four days to have this vision. And I succeeded at that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's gone that way. It kind of flip flops every, every other year or so I succeed and sometimes I fail and there's a lot, you know, it's cliche, but there's more to learn in the failures as well. How does someone come up with a Masogi? Yeah. So that's the cool part. Like a Masogi should be you. It should be, it should be very personal to you. It shouldn't be, I'm going to go run a marathon because then you start comparing yourself to your friend's time or this or that. It should be like, it should be Trevor, you know, it should be you. And, um, there's a couple rules to Masogi, you know, these rules are getting formed as we go, but, um, Dr. Marcus Elliott's rule is there's one rule. It's, uh, it's gotta be so damn hard that you really only have 50, 50 shot at success. And the other one is don't die. Those are his two rules. Um, and I like those. Definitely the second those, one is important. Those are good, those are, those are good <laughs> rules for an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> My gosh. You know, another, another rule I think is, uh, make it personal. Like we just described, it should be, it should be you like uniquely you. That goes back to the integrity piece that you you're kind of like making sure that you keep on track with throughout your life. And so what's 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 powerful even just as you as you work through this with people. Uh who do you when someone says, "Hey, I'm interested in a masogi." Mm -hmm. Uh how do you know they're going to go through with it or it's going to work or they're not going to settle for less than uh yeah how do you how do you know that they're actually gonna step you don't into know it? you don't know yeah. it's it comes down to that moment and you know some masogis fail because the mental fortitude isn't there um but then you get to do it again you get to try again how have you seen failure be uh valuable for oh, you well i mean i've failed at so many things <laughs> so many things and it's, it's, it's taught me so many lessons, you know, and then we live in a society too, where like failure, the consequences are so diminished compared to what they used to be. You know, failure used to be death. Failure when you stood up in front of the tribe and you said something could have been banishment from the tribe, which meant that you were on your own in the wilderness, which typically meant you were not surviving. You're going to be killed by something or someone. Um, failure these days is like you're late. Um, you know, you uh, the conversation you wanted to have didn't go so well. Uh, you didn't get the raise. You know, like it's not life or death these days. And so, yeah, we have this outside fear, outsized fear of failure. And um, when you really stop and think about it, the consequences aren't aren't always they're, they're almost never, um, uh, life or death. So, uh, a, a stat that I heard recently is around the age of 35, you can no longer learn from your successes. You mm. must learn from failures. Mm. And I don't know where that is psychologically, but I've, I, I just remember reading that and thinking that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Honestly, because, yeah. uh, just because you can have enough, enough successes or your brain is fully, you know, formed in that moment. So it's like, you must learn from failure hmm. so that it's intense enough for you to, uh, not repeat it or adjust your way of thinking or change, yeah. uh, your thoughts. And I, I love, I love the way that, cause where you're talking about, I love it because it also reflects on like what, what we're learning as humans psychologically, mm -hmm. just about our, our, our own makeup. As you look to your life, and as you look forward, what are you most excited about? Oh, yeah, exploring the, the limits, like dancing on the edges of what I'm capable of. 
and helping others do the same. That is by far what I'm most excited about. That and seeing my daughter grow up. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I want her to also see her father excited about what he does. That's really, really important to me. My wife uh, called me out. I, I came home from, from work. I was exhausted and not exactly the friendliest guy. Um, I, got, I had nothing left in the tank at that point. And she said to me, she pulled me aside. She said, listen, Sienna needs to see her father enjoying what he does, passionate about it. And she's absolutely right. And that was, that was another big light bulb, lightning moment for me. So, yeah, explore, you know, dancing on the edges and, and really f- seeing what, what, what we're all capable of. Is that, is that one of your main sources then? For all of this? One of my main sources? Yeah, your main sources of inspiration. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you care to talk about that? Just like, why is that, why is that important to you? And what do most people miss if they do have kids or family on, like, why is that important for her mm. to see you live that way? Yeah, you know, it's... Um, as a parent, do you want to provide a good example? Yeah. You know that you're going to mess your kids up. We all do. Our parents did, no matter how hard they tried. But, my God, you want to do the best you can, like the absolute best you can. And you make that commitment when you become a parent. And then it's also, honestly, selfishly, you know, it's 5% here. Like, it's good motivation for me. It's selfish. I... I'm going to use that to fuel me. Um, it's, not, it's not entirely about her. I think what that does for me, as I even think about my own kids, what that does for me is I want, I want more for them than they want for them right now. And I think it's important for us to have people in our life that have that. Mm. <laughs> the right people in your life or my life or in our lives – are the people that want more for us than we want for us. Absolutely. I love that. Well said. And I love surrounding myself, even just with the people in this room right now, I love surrounding myself with people that have bigger dreams for me than I have for me. Mm. Because it keeps me experiencing and living in the fullness that life really has for me. Yeah. And... Mr. Misogi, uh, that's, that's the IG, right? Mr. <laughs> underscore Misogi. Uh-huh. Uh, as you think about others, yes, I, I, I appreciate you even saying like, yes, it's okay that it's even a little bit selfish because it actually holds me accountable. But what's a good accountability is something that holds me to the thing that I really want even when I don't feel like I want the thing. Absolutely. Right? So it's yep. like, that, that's okay. Um. As you think about everyone that's listening to this, what would you like to say, look, hey, we've talked about a lot of things. Remember this. Hmm. Remember and think about this from this moment. Hmm. Yeah. Again, it, it starts with knowing yourself. Really focus in on knowing yourself and go the extra mile. Make it scary. Make it uncomfortable. And that's a noble cause. It's a noble quest. Begin to know yourself. Is there a favorite question that you love to ask yourself Mm. right now that we should be asking? (laughs) Yeah. Is this, is this in, in integrity? Is this Rhett? Ooh, I love that. Is this fill in the blank? Is this you? Is this Trevor? Is this Rhett? Is this who we want to be, integrity? Is this where we want to go? Is this who I really am? Or am I trying to be Rhett? Because I guess what I can't do. I can't be you. Mm -hmm. I can only be me. Yeah. Um, Man, that is so good. I think, man, I'm excited. As people reach out and maybe want to connect or just follow you along, obviously it's, I think it is at Mr underscore Masogi. I think I actually got that right. You got that right. Okay. That's that. That's the Instagram. That, yeah, that, that's the IG. Is it, so follow Rhett 
on there? Is there anywhere else that they can be like, hey, look, I'm interested in more Masogi or I'm interested in more, uh, I want to know more about Ned or anything. Is there anything that you're doing that you'd like to like, hey, I'm, I'm not just, uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, connect or follow. Yeah, sure. So my, my company, Ned, uh, the Natural Remedies Company is uh, at helloned.com. And then my personal website is rettaylor.com, R-E-T-Taylor.com. Awesome. Awesome. Man, it's so good to have you. <laughs> this was awesome. I've, I think we really did lean into that 5%. I think so, too. And I am, uh, I'm looking forward, uh, honestly, to a Masoki with you. Yeah, man, I'd love to get you out there. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm dialed. I think we, let's get the, let's get the whole squad on a Masogi with Rhett. You guys down? <laughs> let's go. Uh, and uh, so thank you so much. It is an honor. And uh, man, I'm just looking forward to, to more, more time with you, honestly. And everybody, just like pray, think, work through who are you. And, uh, and let's be honest about where we are and not settle mm -hmm. let's not settle and let's surround ourselves with the right people that help us get to where we want to go that's what that's you're just um my heart is just full of like okay let's just let's really lean into integrity as humans and yeah. realize that not everyone has it together yeah we're all going through it mm -hmm. um again grateful for you uh you guys have uh, a great great day thank you for leaning in to the Full Advantage podcast. Uh, we'll catch you later. Peace.